think it's probably fair to say that Star Wars is one of the biggest and most successful franchises of all time. And across the years, fans have been spoilt for choice when it comes to action figures and toys based on this very popular property. Yet despite being very successful, and in fact, even groundbreaking in certain circumstances, Star Wars toys have suffered from quite a long history of bizarre entries and strange goofs. In fact, right out of the gate, when Kenner first picked up the license all the way back in 1977, not really expecting big things from Star Wars at all, they were caught massively by surprise by the success of the film. And of course, they weren't able to get product out on shelves in time to support the demand. And quite famously, that Christmas in 1977, they produced the early bed pack where essentially children were gifted this empty case with the promise of 10 action figures if their parents put down a lot of money up front that when these figures were produced they would end up having them later in the next year. Uh, quite a strange and unprecedented approach to try and capitalise on the success of a product that you haven't yet produced. Uh, quite shocking and I don't think it's ever been done before or since. But that was just the beginning. Across the years we've had many toys, but today I'm going to take a look at some of the ones that were just a little bit left field, the ones that were just a little bit of a head scratcher, the ones that just went wrong. Now as ever, to keep things relatively short, I've trimmed this down to just top 10 entries. This is just my personal choice. However, there were many, many, many to choose from. So without further ado, let's push on. Okay, anyone who saw my previous weird and wonderful video dedicated to bootlegs will know all about Darth Vader's Imperial Chopper. So I'm going to get this out of the way early. A few years ago, Hasbro, in their wisdom, or perhaps madness, or even desperation, decided to experiment with the Star Wars license. And they, for some reason, thought there might be a market for people who liked Star Wars, but also liked motorcycles. And to put them both together, we get this Chopper series. It makes absolutely no logical sense. <laughs> There's no reason why these characters would be on motorcycles in the Star Wars universe of all places. The designs are chunky, clumsy, they look nasty, and just plain dumb. I can't really imagine what kind of Star Wars fan these appeal to, but I think even the most ardent collector would have to agree, the Force is not strong with this one. At number nine, I have an entry from the very popular Kenner line of Star Wars films, and in particular, Return of the Jedi. Now, this isn't a bad figure per se. There's actually nothing wrong with this figure in the context of the other figures in this line. But there's a couple of reasons why I've got him on the list. First of all, the appearance of Anakin as played by Sebastian Shaw is very brief. He appears literally as a force ghost right at the very end of the film in his Jedi robes. And being as he is a force ghost, of course he has that bluey transparent aura all about him. Now I think when Kenner got hold of this photo, uh, they extrapolated he was actually in a grey outfit. So the colouring of the costume is wrong. Obviously he should be in brown robes as Obi-Wan Kenobi was. Or if you're going to lean into the force ghost nature, then you'd have to cast him in a sort of either blue shade or perhaps even a translucent plastic. I think it's also funny that the original card art just has an illustrated image rather than the traditional photograph <laughs> to go along with this character as well. And then finally, this is kind of a dull release for a kid. Imagine you're a kid at the time of Return of the Jedi. There's all these fantastic new characters and aliens and fantastic vehicles and playsets to get really stuck into. Do you really want Anakin Skywalker? Essentially an old man in grey robes with grey hair, a pasty face and no accessories, not even a lightsaber. I mean, what are you supposed to do with this in terms of play? <laughs> Why, what is Anakin's story post-death? But hey, I'm well aware that adult collectors are still have a great fondness for this figure, so much so that years later when Hasbro acquired the license, they would produce their own Anakin. But to give them credit, they would at least put him in the right colours and they also included a lightsaber. Mm -hmm. 
One of the great things about the Kenner Star Wars line was the fact that they were keen to explore expanding the Star Wars universe, being able to create vehicles and play sets and really create a world for children to play in, which is recognisably Star Wars. And that is absolutely fantastic. So this entry isn't bad per se, but Kenner did have a tendency to invest in cardboard play sets, which certainly by today's standards is quite an unusual approach and it definitely feels a little bit cheap in places. Now, there were notable exceptions. The Death Star, for example, is very, very cool. This is the uh, European version, the Palatoy version, but it's a very cool playset. Nevertheless, it is the Death Star. All the images on the cardboard settings are really interesting and exciting and, and represents what you see in the film, which is kind of cool. Likewise, the Creature Cantina is also a big success, in my opinion. I think they've managed to create that vibe of the bar. It's one of the crucial scenes in that film and it helps recreate that world and environment to be able to play in. But there are times when it feels like Kenner was overreaching and so we have examples like the Land of the Jowers playset which is essentially recreating a scene that isn't particularly exciting in the film. The Jower vehicle which is probably the most exciting part of this is just a cardboard backdrop and there's really not an awful lot going on here and it's not really a key location most children are going to want to revisit when they're playing with their figures. Likewise, the droid factory from A New Hope is a strange beast. This is not something we see in the film. It's obviously just created for the toy line and essentially it is just a very flat surface with a lot of different pieces that you can assemble together to create your own Frankenstein-like droids. Um, interesting for world building, I suppose, but not the most exciting set on the market. Interestingly, they would repurpose this set some years later for Return of the Jedi for the, uh, the the droid dungeon that we see in Jabba's Palace, which works a lot better. They stick a crane in there and it has a, a lot more appeal, I think. But this initial release uh, is a curiosity to say the least. But it would be pretty remiss of me if I didn't mention Hasbro's attempt at this very same model many, many years later. In a move that just beggars belief, Hasbro would release a Jabba's Palace diorama. Now, the idea of a diorama for Jabba's Palace is absolutely fantastic. What a great idea. And this could have worked if they'd used very firm card, like hard cardboard. Instead, they used very, very thin card, almost paper thin card. Uh, it comes with an exclusive Han Solo and Carbonite block, but uh, sadly, he can't really stand on any of the platforms that it's assembled. It's pretty awful, weak stuff. It looks very nice, but yeah, it was quite rightly denounced by fans who saw this as a very soulless attempt to produce a really, really cheap playset that uh, just sadly wasn't fit for purpose. I think the real tragedy is that if this had been made of plastic, this would have been a bestseller. People would have loved to have had this because the idea behind it, the principle, is really spot on. It's such a shame that it was produced the way it was. Even the best toy companies with the greatest toy lines can make a gaffe every now and again, and Kenner's Star Wars line was no exception. Kenner were naturally keen to capitalise on the success of the aliens of Star Wars. This is one of the key elements that children really responded well to. As a result, they canvassed the cantina to see which aliens would be really fun and relatively simple to bring to toy form. And they hit upon Snaggletooth. Now, Snaggletooth is just one of the background supporting aliens that we see in the cantina. It's a blink and you'll miss it appearance. But I don't think Kenner knew that. In fact, I think all that Kenner had to work on was a grainy black and white reference photograph, which would explain how we end up with Blue Snaggletooth. Blue Snaggletooth is now very famous and is a well sought after figure by collectors because of his rarity and the fact that the figure had to be reproduced en masse. So what was wrong with this version of Snaggletooth? Well, for a start, he's dressed in blue when really his outfit is red. But that wasn't the worst of it. To add insult to injury, he's also significantly too tall. They've made him a normal three and three quarter inch figure in line with Han Solo, Greedo, Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, you name it. But Snaggletooth is actually much smaller. He's more in line with a Jawa than he is with Han Solo. Kenner were quick to realise their mistake and quickly made some running changes and got a different figure out there, a more accurate red suited, pint sized version of the character.
Fandom can be an odd place sometimes. I must have watched Empire Strikes Back a million times, but all the times I've watched that film, I've never ever noticed the background character Wilro Hood. But legions of fans did, and they were clamouring for a Wilro Hood figure for years, so much so that they launched their own petition, and Hasbro listened and eventually produced one in the three and three quarter inch scale. Who is Wilro Hood and what is his mystique? Why are fans so keen to get a hold of a figure of this character? Well, if you're eagle eyed, you will spot him running somewhere in the background of Bespin. And in his arms, he's carrying what appears to be an ice cream maker. This seems to have caught the imagination of fans everywhere. And now those lucky, lucky fans have their own figure of him. Next up we have an example of when a toy company is keen to capitalise on the success of its figures but wants to put a new spin on a popular character that's already been sold. And how do you do this? Well, they have to get a little bit creative and find a way of reimagining that character in a new, fresh light that's gonna make children want to have a duplicate. So when Kenner relaunched their Power of the Force line in the 1990s and they had an all fresh take on some of their popular characters, which came under much criticism at the time for having the much more muscular physiques, Han Solo, as usual, was a bestseller. And along with a couple of other characters who had also sold very well, they decided to find a way to release deluxe versions of those characters. And that's how we ended up with this monstrosity, the deluxe Han Solo with Smuggler Flight Pack. What is a Smuggler Flight Pack, you might ask? No idea. When does Han Solo wear this? Well, I guess it's an off-screen moment. This figure is essentially just a repackaged Han Solo with a basic one from A New Hope, but with a new design on his jacket. He has a new harness, <laughs> which is brightly coloured orange, and this giant top-heavy backpack, which to me just seems to be a smaller version of the power loader from Aliens, but with guns attached. Now, it does say flight pack, so I'm guessing this does give him the ability to fly. I'm really not sure what it is that I'm looking at or what it is it's supposed to do, but I do know it looks ludicrous. <laughs> and it's uh, one of those cases of it definitely jumping the shark. Interestingly, other deluxe figures included Luke Skywalker with a mini skiff. Now, this wasn't so far-fetched. This looked like something that might have happened off screen. Luke might have had one of these hanging around Tatooine somewhere in the backyard. I can imagine him getting on that. I wasn't too far removed from the world of Star Wars, but this just seems absolutely absurd. Okay, back to Hasbro now for what has to be one of the all-time worst Luke Skywalker figures. And I know there's been quite a few bad ones when it comes to likenesses and whatnot, but I have to say this one's got to be the worst. Now, this is an example of Hasbro getting creative once again and trying to resell a figure that's been sold many, many times. Obviously, the impulse here is a good one. They're taking a well-established character from a very famous scene. In this case, Luke Skywalker's final confrontation with Darth Vader in Return of the Jedi makes perfect sense to capitalize on that very significant moment. But how were they going to sell this figure again? Well, this time around, they were going to focus on the action feature. That's right, Luke Skywalker can magnetically attract the lightsaber into his hand and he has this swiping action that can cross swords or lightsabers with Darth Vader. Brilliant stuff. And in the packaging, all looks okay until, of course, you get him out of the packaging and you can see what they've done with both the posture but also the head sculpt. They say a picture can say a thousand words so I've got a handful of images here that I can leave you with and I think that says it all.
If you were a fan of Mace Windu, then the early years of Hasbro acquiring the license to Star Wars probably wasn't a great time for you. In fact, it feels like you would have had to wait a good few years before we got a decent Mace Windu figure. For some reason, it seemed to take Hasbro a very long time to master the likeness of Samuel L. Jackson. And so fans endured many figures with absolutely hideous sculpts that insisted on having the character gurneying in all sorts of weird positions. We had this 12 inch figure from the Attack of the Clones line, which is a nice figure all in all, it's just ruined by this very strange expression in the sculpt. But nothing really compares with their three and three quarter scale figures from Attack of the Clones. We had this arena confrontation version of Mace Windu, which essentially seems to have like a wind up key in his back, which allows the arms to attack the enemy. And sure, I can understand the impulse, but clearly this was never going to work. Who wants a figure that is kind of stuck in one crouching position? It doesn't look great. And then to make matters worse, having that big giant key stuck in his back there, it's not a good look. But hands down, the absolute worst offender has to be the Geonosian Rescue Mace Windu. For some reason, they thought it'd be a great idea to sculpt a version of Mace Windu with his eyes firmly shut and his mouth wide open in what looks like a face of pure contorted horror, anger, frustration, all the things that fans probably felt when they picked up this figure. As part of the Star Wars celebration for 2017, they made a number of exclusive items for those who were there at the event. One of them was this rather strange Sarlacc cuddly toy, which came uh, with a free removable Boba Fett. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure who this is aimed at. I've always kind of assumed that cuddly toys or plush toys are aimed at very small infants or collectors who have children and want to share their passions with them. But this is just far too niche. I mean, this is just too weird. <laughs> It's quite an ugly thing, and it's uh, strange to think that someone thought it was a good idea to make a cuddly toy of a character being slowly eaten uh, by a monster. It's a, it's a it's a bit weird, and it just it doesn't look very nice. And uh, yeah, it's it's pretty strange. Maybe it's just me. There are certain times in life when there's things that people are really into and I just don't get it for whatever reason. It just doesn't appeal to me. So maybe this is one of those times, but I cannot understand for the life of me why the hell anyone would want this set. So let's rewind and give a little bit of context to this. So at the time of Revenge of the Sith, George Lucas and his family had a little cameo in the background. They were supporting artists, they got dressed up, and I'm sure they had a really nice time filming it. And that's a great thing for the family. I don't understand why Hasbro then went and made a figure of those characters, the Lucas family set. I mean, if you're one of the four people in this set, then I think this is a really cool idea and kind of fun novelty. But for the rest of the world, I don't understand why anyone would want to own this. It's such a personal thing to the Lucas family, and it doesn't really have anything really to do with Star Wars. These aren't significant characters in any way, shape or form. And it seems like such a weird notion to me, such a niche thing that Hasbro would go ahead and release an exclusive figure set of the George Lucas family dressed up as Star Wars characters. Like, it's just absolutely mind blowing. I guess there must have been an audience for it. I guess people must have wanted this and it must have sold pretty well, I'm assuming. Otherwise, they wouldn't have made it in the first place because you've got to sell X amount. You've got to know you're going to sell a certain amount of toys in order to go to the trouble of sculpting them, painting them, having them made up in the factories, having them shipped out. I mean, you've got to be fairly confident there's an audience for it. Um, so maybe it's just one of those times when my finger is really off the pulse. But wow, I, I can't see any appeal to this when there's so many Star Wars toys out there based on characters who are <laughs> living and breathing in the films and so significant. I don't understand why you'd want to throw these in there. But hey, as I said, it might just be me and that's absolutely fine. But I have to say, for me, this is the most surreal entry in one of the weirdest Star Wars toys ever made. 
As ever, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the vid, please do give it a like and remember to subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.